Hello, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for joining us today for this public event online. My name is Lydia Moreno. I'm the program manager of an organization called Daylight Academy, and it's my great pleasure to open this second edition of the Daylight Awareness Week. Daylight is something that accompanies us on a daily basis. It uh, enables vision, it warms us, and it's also a well-known and powerful source of energy. But because it is so omnipresent, because it is always there, it is usually taken for granted and it's important for our body, for our health, and also for nature in general, is often unsuspected. So one of the missions of the Daylight Academy is to disseminate scientific knowledge on all the benefits that sunlight can, can offer and create more awareness of this topic. Because we are convinced that this can have a positive impact on public health, but also contribute to a more sustainable development. And that's why we organize this public event today. And uh, this year it is held in the context of the UNESCO International Day of Light, which is on May 16th every year. So before we really start, let me briefly explain what the Delet Academy is. And I will just share my screen to do that. Just a moment. So the Delet Academy is a membership organization um, that was created almost five years ago. And it brings together scientists from different disciplines, architects, um, artists, engineers, and actually all kinds of professionals um, working with daylight related topics. And our main goal is to encourage innovation and the emergence of creative and new ideas in daylight research through this interdisciplinary um, approach. Another goal, as I said before, is to disseminate the knowledge um, among specialists and the public and to create more awareness. The general title for this year's Awareness Week is Three Reasons Why We Need Daylight. And today we will start with the first reason, which is daylight regulates our body functions. So to better understand how natural light affects our body, our health, uh, we are lucky to have with us today three excellent experts with different spe specialities that you will discover in a few moments. But before handing over to them, I would like to stress that you as participants also have an active role in this, in this session. Um, you will have different opportunities to get involved and I really encourage you to ask your questions to the speakers. And to do that, please use the Q&A or the question and answer tool that you can find at the bottom of your screen. And there you can write your question at any time, but you can also vote for the questions you find particularly relevant from other participants and the questions with the most likes would be prioritized by the moderator. At different moments during the session, we will also ask you some questions. And to do that, we will use a tool called Mentimeter. It is independent from Zoom, so it will be easier for you to use your smartphone to answer to this. So please keep your phone within easy reach if possible. Finally, I would like to mention my colleagues that are working in the background today and managing everything and making sure that everything works. So thank you to Mario Betizo from the Veluk Stiftung and also to Laura Grazzi and Jun Stefano both members of SenseDrive, which is a very innovative consulting organization specialized in such um, participatory events. And the last information for you, please note that the webinar is being recorded at the moment and that we are also on YouTube as a live stream and the video will be available on the Daylight Academy website afterwards if you are interested. So now I'm very happy to introduce the moderator of the session, which is Stephen Brown. Stephen is professor of neuroscience at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, specializing in chronobiology and sleep research. Work from his laboratory has shown how daylight 
cycles can reprogram our biological clocks and how specific groups of neurons tell us when to sleep. So a fascinating topic that will be addressed right now. Steven, thank you for being our moderator today and please, the screen is yours. Welcome everyone and thanks very much for joining. As Lydia mentioned, uh, I'll be your guide for the next hour. And our topic is how daylight influences your body. Uh, you'll hear about it from three very different perspectives from three very different professors. Professor Urs Albrecht, a biologist. Professor Thomas Kantermann, a me medical and epidemiological researcher. And Professor Natalia Sokol, a lighting designer. I'll say a bit more about each of them shortly. Now though, I'd like to make sure again that you make your voice heard too, uh, in the question and answer session and in the surveys uh, via the Mentimeter. Uh, as uh, we mentioned, you as the audience are really uh, the purpose of our being here. And I'm really glad that so many of you have decided to join us today. So uh, to get started, let's uh, have a warm up with a few questions. It's always good to get to know your audience. So I'd like to ask you uh, some simple questions. So the first of these questions, and again, you can go to www.menti.com and there is the code up there, 24328284 on your smartphone or in a different window on your computer. And in this way, you can answer the question I'm about to ask, and we can get an idea of who you are. So the first question is, do you consider yourself primarily A, a biologist, B, an architect, C, an engineer, D, a lighting designer, E, a medical professional, F, a teacher, G, an artist, H, a craftsman, or I, uh, we obviously could not list all of your professions, uh, so from another profession. So we can take a look now and see that we have a reasonable number of biologists, uh, lighting designers, engineers, other professions, the numbers are coming in. So as you can see, you're a very diverse group and indeed uh, you'll discover that the effects of daylight upon your lives are as diverse as you yourselves are. And I hope we'll be able to uh, discuss uh, today some of the mechanisms by which this happens and some of the practical ways that professionals such as lighting designers and engineers are uh, helping to bring daylight into your life. So thank you very much for this uh, first uh, question. Uh, the second question is an idea of how well you know the topic. So on a scale of one to five, how familiar are you with the biological effects of daylight? Uh, and here we'll be able to get an idea of, uh, so there we have a few people who are very familiar. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and once again, you are looking like uh, a quite reasonably uh, diverse audience. We'll give this another minute to see uh, what is happening here. Thank you very much. As we can see, we have a wide variety of backgrounds, which is what we hoped for. And finally, uh, a more fun question. Uh, what is the first word that comes to your mind when you think of daylight? You can just tap it right in and uh, we'll see what kinds of impressions we get. And as you can see, uh, the many facets of daylight are being reflected in the many facets uh, of your answers. And hopefully today we'll be exploring uh, the many facets uh, by which this happens and by which it gets implemented. So uh, I think we can get started here and move to the first speaker who is Professor Urs Albrecht, uh, who is a professor of biochemistry at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland. 
and he'll be talking about the influence of light on physiology. Urs, please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Stephen, for this nice introduction and this nice poll, which gives me a nice uh, overview of the audience. And I see many of you, they know already a bit about daylight. And uh, I will focus now in my talk on the influence uh, of uh, light on physiology and biochemistry. And uh, for uh, this, we have just to take a step back and look uh, you know, a little bit from outside on what basis our life has evolved. And as you see, Earth is regularly exposed to light due to its own rotation around its own axis and around the sun. So light um, appears actually very regularly depending on the speed, of course, of the rotation on Earth. And uh, this rotation is about 24 hours. So you get every 24 hours, you get sunrise, more or less. And this um, sunrise or this appearance of light has been used in during evolution as a reference point because this point appeared very regularly and therefore it gave uh, organisms the opportunity to uh, order or organize uh, the biology, biochemistry and physiology according to that light appearance because it allows an organism to predict what is going to happen to predict when cer certain things uh, may appear in nature. And this all with a reference to the light that is appearing. And um, during evolution, then we uh, internalized uh, this geophysical property in the form of a circadian clock. And as you see here on uh, the right hand side, these clocks they are all over the body because this timing device that evolved uh, based on this light dark cycle is present in every single cell. So every cell has this timing device. And uh, this then of course leads in our body because we are composed of many, many cells to a kind of uh, a clock shop. So we are full of different clocks and um, the problem then that arises, of course, is that these clocks somehow have to be synchronized to each other because otherwise they cannot um, convey time information in a coordinated manner to the different organs, for example. And uh, therefore you need uh, uh, like an orchestra's conductor and uh, this or the a suprachiasmatic nuclei here in the center um, of the brain. And uh, these suprachiasmatic nuclei, they synchronize or give signals to the rest of the body clocks in order to generate a coherent circadian system. So this is a system of clocks that are uh, coordinated and synchronized to each other. So synchronization here is very important. Now, uh, these suprachiasmatic nuclei, they are connected to the eye, which receives daylight, and this allows the SCN to be set to the daylight cycle uh, every day. And this is very important because our clocks, they are not very precise. So they are not exactly 24 hours. And also over the seasons, the light appearance uh, changes, so the sun rises. And therefore, you need to have some flexibility to adapt your circadian system to the external light dark cycle. So that is one thing. And the other thing that the light is doing, it is very important for our cells uh, in the skin to uh, synthesize vitamin um, D. Now, uh, speaking of the SCN, I just want to show you uh, in a, um, a little movie how these uh, SCN actually uh, have a time of day dependent activity. Here on top, you see a coronal section. So that is like this, a section through the head of a mouse. And in the ventral part down here, you see these two small nuclei, the suprachiasmatic nuclei that have this um, <clears throat> activity 
that is oscillating. And this appears here, down here on this uh, time-lapse video. So you see the, the activity is appearing here and then it goes away again and it comes back. And this oscillation is uh, visualizing the circadian activity of this nucleus that synchronizes all the other body clocks. So um, that is the good side of light actually, that uh, the light can influence this SCN to reset it according to um, the light dark uh, cycle, the external cycle. So to organize the body in synchrony with the environment. However, what you experience sometimes, especially in winter, when we have short days and long nights, that uh, yeah, you feel more depressed in winter often. And then there is a syndrome, the seasonal affective uh, disorder syndrome, uh, which um, makes people during winter times uh, sad. And uh, it has been uh, found that when you use light here towards the end of the dark phase, that you can cheer up people by this kind of treatment, which is kind of astonishing. And uh, the question then, of course, is yeah, how can this work? And here to briefly illustrate this to you, you see here that the eye is connected basically to rest of, to the rest of our brain, and uh, you have here in the retina uh, a connection directly here to the brain, to the back part of the brain via the optic chiasm, which is uh, responsible that we can see. Uh, shapes and colors. But there is a second uh, connection, as I already mentioned, the connection from the retina via specialized cell cells, the, the ganglial cells in the retina that are directly connected to the SCN and give the SCN a signal to synchronize it to the environment. However, this is not the only connection uh, of the retina to the brain. There are several other connections as shown here, and several of those connections, they uh, land in clocks that um, are influencing uh, mood-related behavior. So they regulate actually our mood. And now when you have short uh, winter days, the signal that reaches here, these different brain areas is very short and is very little. So that, uh, impinges that uh, these nuclei here can synchronize to each other. So the synchronization is very poor. And that is the reason why then the biochemical processes that are finely tuned to each other get out of sync. And so eventually uh, neurotransmitters are less uh, are produced in a lower amount and that leads to reduced um, well-being. And now, how, how can you now synchronize this? So you apply a light pulse, which then when you give this at the right time, and that is very important as we see here, when you do it towards the end of the dark phase, you uh, give a pulse and this helps to synchronize all these clocks in the brain. And uh, that then is beneficial for uh, mood because the synthesis and uh, degradation of neurotransmitters such as dopamine are regulated and are boosted in that manner. So that is the good side of light. Uh, and the bad side of light is when you get it at the wrong time. And to this, uh, this we are all used to because you experience here the work on the screen in the evening or shift workers can also tell you stories about uh, their well-being after several weeks of uh, night shift and also the pollution uh, in cities in the evening, in the early evening that affects uh, our uh, behavior. So uh, in, uh, in a diagram, this is seen here. So you get confounding effects of light and uh, screens that give a, a wrong signal through the eyes to the SCN, and that can basically lead to a desynchronization of the clocks in the SCN. And this 
then is transmitted to the rest of our body. And when you, uh, for example, perform shift work over a longer time period, uh, leads to desynchronization of the circadian system. And as a consequence, it disturbs our normal body functions because our biochemical processes are not finely tuned to each other anymore. And in the long run, this leads to neurological problems, depression, cardiovascular disease, and also to obesity and uh, diabetes. So you see the timing is essential when you get the light. It can be good or bad. So what we learn from all of this is first that our body is temporarily organized. So you're not all the time the same. So you're not always uh, the same in the morning as you are in the evening and you feel that yourself. So temporal organization of our body. Second, we are strongly influenced by the environment that you probably also experienced yourself during winter and summer months when you compare these two and uh, your well-being. And third, when you have disruptions of this temporal organizations due, uh, organization due to uh, shift work or jet lag, then you start feeling consequences. So which in the long run can lead to the, um, the development of diseases such as uh, obesity or depression. And uh, third, light can be used as a treatment when you put it at the right time. So by this, I thank you for your attention and we can uh, take some questions. So thanks very much, Urs, uh, for this very interesting presentation. So again, you can go to the question and answer uh, session and uh, type the questions in uh, that you uh, might wish uh, to see. So uh, I guess uh, one question which was asked by Per Reinhold, uh, the light pulse for synchronizing clocks, how long does this pulse need to be? Uh, this pulse can actually be very short. So at least in mice, uh, 15 minutes of uh, 200 to 500 lux of light is sufficient to synchronize uh, the, uh, the clocks. And um, usually, of course, the behavioral effects you see a day later because uh, the, the molecular uh, answers to this light pulse is immediate. So it is within 15 to 30 minutes, but the consequences on behavior they will then take several hours. So usually you see it the following day, which in terms of depression is basically fast enough, you know, that you see the positive effect uh, of light. Thanks very much. So uh, there's a question from Timo Partinen about morningness and eveningness, which I believe we'll delay till next session because I know that Thomas is going to be speaking a bit okay. uh, about that. Uh, a question from Connie Berger, uh, talking about short winter days and seasonal affective disorder. Uh, it varies with your location on the planet. That is to say, the farther north you are, the more likely you are to get it. Uh, she's wondering if you can shed light on this subject. Uh, is, is there anything known about this direct connection? Uh, so shedding, I can shed some light on, on this. Uh, I mean, of course, it is depending on the location and not all people are, of course, affected by it because it depends on the setup of your own biology and all your biochemistry. But um, we have evidence in mice that indeed a special brain area, the so-called habenula, appears to be involved in transmitting this light pulse and affecting then downstream other brain regions which then most likely, this mechanism we don't know yet, affects synthesis of neurotransmitters such as uh, dopamine. So that is uh, that much I can say in a short time about this now. Understood. Certainly a question <laughs> that is uh, deserving of more research uh, yes. uh, at the moment. Uh, another question which uh, has just been voted up, so it moved on me. Uh, from 
Adil Shag Eldon. Uh, can Dr. Albrecht explain why the brain is stimulated by different light frequencies more than others? Yeah, um, beca because you see that the, the brain is connected to, to the retina and the retina contains many different photoreceptors which have uh, different spectral sensitivities and they can then uh, connect to various brain regions. And there I have to say, I think not all of them have been already um, identified yet, but this is uh, probably why uh, certain brain regions uh, are sensitive to other wavelengths. Uh, and th the best example is basically our vision is very different from um, our sensitization of just light and darkness, the, the different photoreceptors that we have uh, in the retina. And finally, uh, quite a uh, technical question from uh, Subhamita Metra. Uh, is the changes of effects of light a direct consequence of the light intensity or does it go through some kind of SCN desynchronization? So you talked so about not, different clocks. Yeah, so not all light signals go through the SCN. Some of the light signals, they actually um, are not going through the SCN, which also means that light signals are not all necessarily clock dependent. And um, this, uh, I think, is, is very important because otherwise uh, we could not um, sensitize um, over 24 hours light in, uh, all the time, but we, we do sensitize light all the time, and which indicates that uh, this is not entirely depending on the clock. And it is known that these connections from the retina to certain brain regions are not going through the SEA. And one final question. There were many excellent questions there, which I hope we'll have time for in the round table, which I've expressly been avoiding those questions that would interest multiple speakers. Uh, so one from Kieran Gerhardson. Uh, why was the body clock not perfectly synchronized to the 24 hour day? Uh, wouldn't uh, a perfect 24 hour clock have been a bit better evolutionarily in the long run? Um, so the, the problem on earth is that uh, due to the seasons, we never have the perfect day, you know? <laughs> we have uh, winter and summer um, days that are longer or shorter. And by that, of course, the appearance of light shifts as well. So you need to have an adaptable system that can react uh, at any time uh, to, to light and uh, just shift the clock uh, every day just by uh, one or two minutes, which actually occurs. So we would, even if we would have exactly 24 hour clock, it would never be uh, perfect because the, um, uh, the precision, so the appearance of light um, changes um, over the seasons, but but still um, to have a shorter or a longer period, like uh, you know the rodents have a shorter period, and the um, humans, for example, have a longer circadian period. Um, why this is exactly like this? That some have a longer and others have a shorter period. This is not really understood. So it's still. Um, under investigation why uh, this is actually really the case. And a, a very good um, mechanistic answer to uh, this uh, property that our clock is not really exactly 24 hours, um, we uh, do not know yet, but most likely it is due to the flexibility uh, that we need to adapt to, uh, to the environment. Thanks very much. Uh, fascinating session, excellent questions. If you see a question there that you would like to hear answered, you can vote it up in the chain and we'll get to it in the discussion. Now, however, it's time to introduce uh, the next speaker uh, who is Professor Thomas Kantermann. Uh, 
Thomas is a human chronobiologist. Uh, that is to say, we're all uh, human uh, scientists, of course. Uh, however, uh, Thomas studies human beings as his principal subjects uh, at the University of Applied Sciences in Essen, Germany. Uh, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much. It is, it is an honor for me to speak here today, and I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about your questions and, and, the, and the discussion afterwards. So, um, listening to Urs, um, so, so he was talking about the, the conductor and the individual clocks in the body. And um, so he, he is investigating these, these synchronization processes between the conductors and these individual clocks. So my area is, is on, the, on the way other end here, on the symphony, as you wish. So the, the product of all these individual clocks and what the conductor is doing in them. And especially I'm interested in the circumstances in our environment, in our lifestyles that disturb this symphony. And one of the most pronounced and, and most obvious um, outcomes of the circadian clocks is our chronotype. So are you a rather early type or a late type? And I want to use this um, as the basis for my presentation. And whoops, I need to show the other one as the basis for this to illustrate you where some of the difficulties um, come from. And many of these difficulties probably will be familiar to you um, at, some, at some point. So chronotype is the manifestation of the circadian phenotype. This is, it, it's most obvious to most of us that, that we distinguish ourselves from other people, especially among family members. If you have younger people in the home, um, you clearly see that they tick somewhat different than you do and it changes with age and there are differences between males and females and your chronotype is influenced by where on this planet you live and it is influenced by the light environment and when you think about this uh, impact that the light environment plays a certain role here then it's easy to understand that the environments we are living in and the lifestyle choices we, 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 we pick, that these have an influence on the light exposure and the changed light exposure then has an effect on our health and our sleep and our chronotype and so forth. And the, whoops, Chronotype diversity uh, can be assessed in different ways, and, and these are three examples here on this slide. You see on the on the top um, two different chronotypes here assessed with actigraphy. The red one is the early type. The blue one is the late type. Um, so the the shape of these curves look very um, similar, but they are shifted in phase. So you see that the early type um, starts his or her day a couple of hours earlier than the late type does, and so he or she goes to bed earlier. And this, again, can be assessed by questionnaires, and this is what you see on the bottom here, um, looking at the mid-sleep of these individuals. Um, if you sleep from midnight till eight, for instance, your mid-sleep is at four, four o'clock. And this is where, where the mid-sleep for most um, Europeans live, lies. This is what you what you see in this figure and it's a huge diversity so we see that the, the lighting environment the lifestyle choices etc et do play a role in how this chronotype is is manifested um, and you have these, these very rare late types with them it's sleep around 9 a.m or 10 a.m or even noon um, and on the other end you have those, those um, with the mid sleep around midnight also rare people, but most of them are here in the middle. Um, besides these actigraphy and the, the sleep um, assessments, um, we do know that the circadian chronotype can be assessed by things like melatonin, which is the gold standard we, we currently have. And this is what you see on the right figure here, um, a simple correlation between the time point in the evening when your melatonin starts to rise and where your mid-sleep 
actually is. And the later you are, or the earlier you are, respectively, your melatonin comes up earlier or later in your body. So it's a clearly biological phenomenon we see. Um, and there are some challenges. One of these is, is exemplified here in one late um, um, teenager. And you see his or her sleep timing during school days, this is the upper part, and during vacation. So you could think of this, like this is what, what his biology was, was planned to do. And on top, you see how it's actually going. Um, so when he or she is on vacation, the sleep timing is very consistent and there, there's not much deviation from day to day. But you see the, lar the, the, the large difference when he or she is, is at school. And during school days, you see the sharp um, termination of sleep here with the alarm clock. And you see these longer bouts of sleep, which are the free days in these individuals. So this back and forth is very usual for teenagers because they have a later clock and they have to be <laughs> among the earliest types in our, or behave as the earliest types in our society because of the early school hours. Um, the, 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 the difficulty here is that um, having our eyes open or having our eyes closed is, is the strongest signal to our circadian clock. So by closing our eyes or opening our eyes, we, we, we give light to our circadian clock or we prevent our circadian clock from seeing light. So it's, it's this it's these self-managing um, system that then translates into, into difficulties, in, into training. So to say the, the circadian clock goes back and forth in these individuals. And of course, it's not just one late type, but it's a whole bunch of individuals. And this is a distribution here that we collected at school. So you see here the midpoint of sleep in, in um, teenagers, 14 to uh, yeah, 18 years. And a, big, oops, and a big portion of these have their mid-sleep. So the midpoint of their sleep at four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in the morning. And this is the time where they actually sit in school um, trying to learn something, be, be attentive. And this is, of course, problematic. So the, these early school hours, they're not just, they're not just um, well, terminate sleep too early and, and lead that our students and our children sit in class in the middle of their biological night. But on top of it, they are exposed to light at the wrong circadian phase. And um, this, again, of course, leads to um, a number of problems. To me, this, this, this phenomenon of, of early school hours um, and late teenagers reminds me of the difficulties we see in shift workers. And Wurz just mentioned this in, in his presentation, that this is one of the most problematic issues we have in our society because shift work um, means you have light at night, otherwise you can't work. So light at night at times where light is not supposed to be um, present for your circadian system. There's too little light during the day, or maybe in some of the shift work is not any daylight during the day. And the shift work schedule leads to these, these quick alternations of, of, of back and forth. And if you have different shift, if you have morning, early, late night shift, et cetera, then it's it's this this well it's the, the constant this discontinuity in 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 training signals that that irritates the body and that makes it very difficult for people to adjust to these shift work regimes. So even if if people are in permanent night shift, um, still it means that at some point. They want to meet family or friends or need to do some shopping or whatever, um, which makes them day active again. So even for permanent night shift workers, they are not permanent night active, but even they are rotating shift workers. And we did a study on these in a, in a hospital in Germany um, where we collected light information with, the, with a light sensor attached to the body in people working in the hospital, mainly nurses. And you see these, these, these outcomes here in terms of their light measurements. So you have on the left, 
you have light exposure during the day shifts and you see these, these pronounced light exposure during daytime hours, so between 6 and, and, and 8 a.m. And right to it, you see the light exposure in the same individuals during night shifts. And you see some light during the night here and you see some, some light here in the later part of the day. And I've drawn these rod, um, red, red circles around here to show you the, the different um, scaling in these figures. So within this red circle, yeah, so th this is the comparable portion. And you see that the, the during night shift periods, these individuals, that during um, night shift periods, these individuals are hardly visible, um, um, hardly uh, exposed to daylight. So we call these changes in, in sightgeber strength. And this leads to difficulties that we just hear from, from Urs. Physiology, psychology, academic performance goes down. Um, it's highly costly um, intensive. So about 1.6% um, of our um, um, gross product in, in Germany, for instance, is, is, a, is, a, is a result of this, of this lack of sleep and, and circadian disturbances. So what we propose is, of course, to have more daylight um, during work, sport, and play, um, to shift school hours to later times, to have more daylight in classrooms, um, less night shift if possible. And of course, if you, if you cannot have sufficient daylight in a day, to look for or to, to watch for the um, artificial light exposure in the evenings and to protect your, your eyes from it, dim screen intensity, use orange glasses, et cetera, et cetera. So the simple solution um, to find out about how, how your circadian clock ticks and how you can manage with, with light exposure is to do sort of a digital detox um, week or two where you, where you reduce artificial light exposure and expose yourself more to daylight. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm curious now um, about your questions. And thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for an excellent uh, talk. So uh, I'll start uh, with a question that is carried over from last time that I thought was very relevant here from uh, Jacob Apple. Do people that consider themselves night owls or early risers have different internal clocks uh, from one another? Well, they, they do differ in their, well, in, in the circadian phase, of course, how they are entrained with respect to the 24-hour light, light dark cycle. And there are differences in, in circadian period. So we do know that, that there are individuals with fast ticking clocks and slower ticking clocks. And this, at some level, in, the, in, the, in your body, in your system, at some level translates into, into this if you are rather earlier or later time. So there are indeed um, physiological um, clock property differences that makes you an early or later type. Thank you. So a question that is tying uh, your presentation to that of Urs, you were talking about morning and evening types. Uh, Urs was talking about clocks influencing mood, a question from Timo Partinen asking whether the behavioral trait of morningness and eveningness is somehow affecting uh, mood per se. Oh, mood per se. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not convinced it's, it's impacting mood per se. It's, it's rather the, the, the construct you're living in. So if, I mean, being a late type or being an early type per se, I think it's not the, it's not the, the problem or the difficulty, but it depends in what circumstance you're living. So if you are a, a teenager, um, late from your biology, but forced to go to school early. And we did these studies in, in, in a spa town in Germany where, where there was a single bus um, picking up the students every morning from their homes. And we had these teenagers getting up at five every morning to, to catch the bus at six to be at school at seven. So it was terrible. Um, so this, this, this dilemma then um, leads to these, these mood changes and these, these difficulties. So I don't think that, that being a late type or an early type per se is, is the problem, but depending on what circumstances you are living in and can you live that <laughs> typology or, or, or can't you live it? I think this is, this is the problem. Thank you. Uh, a, question, a practical question from uh, Eli uh, Mushi. Uh, sorry for that pronunciation. Uh, when should we stop being exposed to light before bedtime? 
in your opinion? So the usual, so the 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 usual recommendation and the the consensus we have in the field is is, is between two to three hours before the expected bedtime. So so the problem is you need to find out what your usual bedtime is. But but we we but we would say two to three hours before you go before you go to bed or before you want to sleep, and the and the um, the the difficulty then is is to to well I mean not to make it too dark because because you don't want to to, to trip and fall as it right at home of course, but to to keep a wider distance from the light sources to your eye. And, and to, to think wisely what light sources you actually need. So it's about two to three hours before. This, it, it's connected to the point, to the time point when your melatonin starts to rise in your body, which is about two to three hours before you sleep onset. Thank you. So uh, another question from Udicha Bagchi. So do you think that having an extreme chronotype is giving you a predisposition to diseases uh, like obesity, cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, or is it just a behavioral trait per se? Um, I think it's 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 the it's it's the connection. If you if you are late but forced to live an early lifestyle, then you are in trouble. Um, I'm 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 not aware that that there's a clear link get shown in the data that that late types per se carry an in, in, in increased risk of developing these, these issues. It's, it's, the, it's the dilemma between your chronotype and, and your lifestyle. We, see, we, we do see this in shift work studies. When you look at chronotype and shift workers, the, the later types do much better during night shifts than the early types. And the early types do better in the morning shift. So the, the late types do worse in the morning shift. So it's, it's, it's this, this connection. That, that, that makes it difficult. So the we, we, we do know that there is a is, is a strong selection, self-selection in, in these occupations. So if um, if if I can't stand it, um, I drop out. And usually people <laughs> try, at least they try to end up in, in 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 workplaces, in occupations where they can live by their by the circadian clock. It, it's not possible in all jobs, of course, but but in many it is. Uh, thank you. A question from Connie Berger, uh, again, a practical one, uh, this time asking about your advice in public policy. Since all of this about uh, school time has been known such a long time, what in your opinion is holding back schools from implementing such a nice, uh, healthy recommendation? Oh, oh this, this is diverse. Some schools don't know they can do it. Some schools blame their 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 their, their, their county or, or their government. It's, it's, it's therefore they need to do the first step. Um, the difficult part is you need to get all parties on the same table. So it's the teachers, it's the students, it's the parents. Ideally, it's the employers of the parents um, to agree on on how to how to do something better <laughs> for their kids. Um, without without bringing too much disturbance, it's it's not it's not that easy to do it um, over one weekend and you just switch uh, school hours. Um, it's possible. So there are a number of schools on the planet who did it, um, but it's it's a longer it's a longer process. It's it, it's basically it's resistance to change, um, as we often see in, in societal things. Um, it's you need to have a long breath for these things, um, starting slowly and then building up step by step and get everyone involved at the same table. And then step by step, starting with pilot projects would, would be a good idea, not to not to come up with, with the perfect solution, but to say, let's try to find out together, what can we do? And then step by step, trying out what, what works best. Thank you very much. Uh for an excellent presentation and some superb questions uh, from the audience. I've noticed a few technical questions about lighting design, which I've held off for uh, discussion after the next speaker's presentation. Uh, before we go to the next presentation though, a number of you have been asking practical questions. When should I get lights? How should I get lights? And uh, we'll be coming back to those in the broader circle of uh, roundtable discussion. But first, I'd like to ask you a question. And that is, what could you do in your life 
to get more access to daylight. And now we can compare what you practically think you could do to what the experts say you ought to be doing, and we'll see how that works. And that should be interesting by the end. Uh, so uh, you can write these answers uh, directly into the chat, and uh, they'll be uh, collated for us. Meanwhile, however, I think it's time to move on to uh, the next speaker, uh, who is uh, Professor Natalia Sokol from Gnaik's University of Technology in Poland. She is a professor of lighting design and daylight in architecture. Uh, Natalia, if uh, you would uh, share your screen, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really happy to be here and uh, to shed some light on daylight comprehension and daylight assessment and daylight design within the built environment. So I'm talking about the application part. Uh, and I hope it also uh, it will uh, this talk will uh, contribute to today's discussion on how daylight regulates the body and how important daylight is for us. Uh, so uh, I hope you can see my presentation right now. Yeah. So let's start. Um, so I've decided to talk about challenges which uh, um, designers or architects face when they think about. Uh, uh, designing a building or a couple of buildings in relation to daylight. And one of the first challenges we have to consider is that uh, daylight has to be considered in different scales. So we have a city scale, building form and interior spaces. And with those, uh, we know that we have, we live in the cities and we know the cities with different, uh, 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 with different climates and uh, uh, with different densities. And in, when it comes to urban planning, uh, everything is important in terms of daylight. I mean, daylight availability, local climate, density factors, local like regulations, uh, cultural influences, the things we can, uh, for example, notice from uh, 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 historical treatments of daylight. And finally, different users' needs, because you have to remember when you're designing a city, you have different users. You have people who work within the city uh, and people who live within the city and they need more greenery and more uh, public spaces to meet. So we have a lot of factors to consider. Then when we go to the building scale, uh, again, we have many types and uh, buildings with many functions and then many ways how to introduce daylight into them. And it's designer responsibility to actually uh, find a perfect and optimal way for, for a form uh, or a mass of the building to, to introduce daylight. Uh, then we have to think about uh, facade consideration. Of course, we have local regulations, we have rights to light. We have to think about uh, 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 what uh, our future users will need in terms of rights to daylight and uh, uh, whether, uh, what is the uh, relation between the, the building we are designing to the building already existing in the uh, building environment. And uh, then again, we are looking into uh, vernacular architecture solutions and trying to find out whether we suit with our design. And then we are going to interior. And when we have interior, we usually talk about control of light because we want to, uh, um, to um, have perfect conditions to, to design perfect conditions for visual, uh, different visual tasks, which our uh, uh, users uh, 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 have. And we want to accommodate the visual, biological and psychological uh, uh, needs of our future uh, habitants of the buildings, of the users of the buildings. Then we have to think about finishes, room layouts, and of course, the light control system. Uh, we want uh, to balance daylight in our uh, buildings uh, to keep the, uh, the users happy. So a lot of factors to consider and it's a challenge. Then a second challenge we have to consider is changeability of daylight. I know you like it, we all love it, but, uh, but daylight changes in, uh, in terms of its spatial, temporal and spectral uh, characteristics. And therefore it's difficult to assess and measure. And we need this assessment because this is a challenge. Uh, we need to know 
how they like behaves in order to uh, make a sound design decisions. And uh, just a, a bit about the difference between daylight assessment and appraisal and daylight design. When we talk about daylight appraisal, we usually talk about daylight verification and quantification. And it can be done in any stage of the daylight design process or building design process or planning process. But when we talk about daylight design, we need assessment to ensure good daylight at a possible low energy consumption level. And it should be done at the very early stage of our planning or design process. Uh, and uh, the third challenge, uh, we uh, how to assess daylight in and uh, around buildings. Uh, it's a challenge. We like uh, daylight inside the building, uh, and uh, we need to assess it. Uh, we have a lot of metrics, tool uh, indicators, which tell us uh, how daylight works. But the problem for the designer and the challenge is to pick the right methods to assess daylight at right indicators like right tools right metrics and then to uh to look at the results to generate a simulation look at the results draw conclusions and incorporate those uh conclusions into our design and uh, of course we are uh, equipped with state our uh, computer uh, softwares which even tells us uh, uh, we can generate uh, some results how uh, for example non-visual effects of uh, uh, light impact uh, future users but still the challenge for the designer is to 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 um, find the right uh, uh, methods for the intended project and just to give you a background, there are many types of daylight assessment methods. We can work with scale, met, uh, scale uh, uh, models of the buildings. We can uh, do uh, 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 we can make uh, in situ measurements, so we can measure different uh, daylight indicators. We can run computer simulations, uh, and uh, we can look at dynamic uh, daylight uh, indicators uh, and a static one. We have formulas and and different tables and graphs, uh, calculation methods, and then we can go to the users and ask them about their subjective uh, perception and satisfaction with daily environment. Um, but we have emerging metrics, and this is uh, uh, this is exciting. I mean, it's difficult to exactly say how to quantify uh, 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 irradiance uh, in biologically uh, meaningful units, but uh, there are some attempts, and we have metrics, uh, uh, circadian metrics like melanopic irradiance or circadian light or circadian effective area, which are emerging. Uh, but uh, the problem is that all those metrics, uh, uh, we have to choose the right one for the project. And that's that's the challenge for the designer. And finally, the fourth challenge, we have to comply with regulation. So uh, we have a bunch of regulation, national ones, uh, regional ones, uh, international ones which tells us how to design uh, to, uh, and how to ensure good quality daylight and what really uh, good quality daylight means. And of course, we have a discourse between uh, practitioners and researchers, whether we really need uh, uh, restrictions and whether we need uh, standards and how to make them in a way that they should be more beneficial for design uh, and less restrictive. And just uh, a quick look at the one of uh, uh, recent uh, standards, which was published in December 2018, and it was an effect of uh, uh, long uh, and tough uh, uh, work uh, done by some members of the light, international lighting community. And uh, this standard tells us how to, um, gives us some recommendations and tell us how to assess uh, daylight within uh, the built environment uh, in terms of interiors. So we have categories like uh, adequate subjective impression of uh, lightness indoors. We have adequate view out and uh, duration of sunset exposure within habitable rooms. We also have some uh, 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 criteria uh, 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 which talks about the glare. 
So uh, going deeper into one of these categories, which is often commented by architects, is uh, uh, from the start of building, uh, daylight in buildings, uh, uh, the category which uh, uh, tells us about uh, the assessment of the view out. And we have three subcategories here. We talk about the view in terms of the side angle, distance, and, uh, and number of uh, visible layers. And to have to provide minimal adequate view according to this standard, the European standard, we should have a horizontal side angle uh, wider than 14 degrees and outside distance of the view uh, larger than six meters. And we should be able to see at least uh, a landscape layer. And to conclude those challenges, please remember that daylight impacts building functions on multiple scales. And we have those scales to work with. Uh, we have to take into account that daylight is not constant and we have to, uh, with our design, we have to address it. And then we have a number of uh, assessment methods and simulation tools which help designers to evaluate daylight and find optimal uh, daylight solution. The key is to find the right ones for the project. And then regulation, they try to ensure minimal criteria for daylight, uh, uh, um, but they not ensure a good design. It's still up to the designer. So thank you so much. Uh, I hope you will have some questions uh, after that. And thank you, you Natalia, for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, there is certainly no shortage of questions. I'm going to uh, start with a question that has been uh, sitting here for uh, an entire session now from Lisa Vester Pedersen, uh, who is also a designer. Uh, and so this person was wondering, uh, how do you balance uh, the idea of blue light nanometer 480 uh, in terms of its effectiveness versus getting uh, much more intensity of light of a different wavelength, which is supposed to be uh, less effective for your biological clock. Uh, do you think of different wavelengths of light as you are designing uh, buildings and uh, how does this affect what you do? In practical terms, you, you can, of course, uh, uh, usually think about sunlight and skylight. Uh, but in practical terms, you can use some filters or, or the, the glazing with a special filters uh, to uh, a fill uh, filter um, uh, uh, the, 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 the length of uh, uh, light waves. But uh, you have to be aware that in practical words, uh, if your client wants this, if your investor really uh, uh, is, um, uh, wants something like that, then you can research and you can uh, work on uh, such solutions. But in practical terms, uh, do you think we do it on the early... Uh, basis or early day, day basis. No, we are not doing that. I mean, the point for the for the lighting designer and the architect that the, the major concern is to provide, to create a building uh, which, uh, which, is, uh, which is good for the users, which is user friendly in terms of daylight conditions as well. And it's very difficult to balance the daylight. We don't have excessive daylight. We don't have, uh, uh, we, we want daylight, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a correct amount. And we want to know how to control it. That's the key point in terms of architecture. Thank you. So another question from Alejandro Diaz Infante. Uh, you've described lots of challenges what do you consider the main challenge for architects to actually create a well-lit indoor space? Uh, to consider uh, daylight and comprehend daylight from the very beginning of the project. And this is something we are trying to teach uh, uh, our students that uh, uh, even the students from the second year, we're trying to, uh, to uh, teach them how to comprehend daylight in different scales and how to do it in, from the perspective of the user, but also from the perspective of the designers, because you have to predict certain behavior of daylight or how, how, uh, how daylight really affects the users of the building. 
and that's the major challenge. So I would say education and co considering daylight from the very first stage of the design idea, that, that's the, the key to successful design, in my opinion. Thank you. A question uh, from, oh, it just moved on me. Uh, there it is, uh, from uh, Connie Berger uh, about uh, the question of insulation in houses. Uh, so double or triple glass windows. Uh, and how does this affect uh, daylight per se? Is anything being filtered out by all of this additional glass that we should worry about? Yes, yes, of course. And when we are when you are designing a building, you usually work with uh, uh, people who provide glazing, and you can choose different types of glazing. And then you are asking about different parameters and uh, uh, and of course uh, transmitters of uh, of your glazing and. It's up to you know to the to the design uh, um, script what you want to uh, you know incorporate in your building, but there are a lot of information and the the problem is that there are sometimes too many information to choose from. Understood, and a related question which unfortunately just moved off my screen. Uh, I will find it and uh, announce the person who presented it, but it was dealing with climate change. So in general, how has climate change affected lighting design? I think it does in a way, uh, because uh, uh, you know, um, changeability of daylight is, is something we have to address uh, as a designer when we are designing the buildings. Uh, I, I, I cannot say about the immediate effect, but uh, definitely people started to think about their connection because you have to remember that daylight in the building is also windows and the windows provide uh, an access to the uh, 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 external world, your, uh, your connection with the external world. And I think uh, uh, users of the building started to be more uh, aware, especially uh, uh, after this year, what they see and how they react with uh, the external environment. And all the changes uh, are also important. I, I, from my perspective, I, did, I can see that the client started to be worried whether the design of the building is, for example, impacting, uh, whether it has an impact on the environment. This is a very good sign for us that people are you know, looking for pro ecological pro environmental solutions in terms of the design. Thank you. And that question, by the way, was from Timo Partinen. Thank uh, you. Another question, uh, a relatively technical, but I think important question. You've talked about uh, glare and uh, melanopic light, the light that's affecting your biological clock. Uh, are these in conflict uh, in, to some extent? And how do you actually deal with this conflict? The idea that glare light is unpleasant, but light yeah, is- Yeah, uh, I mean, there is a lot of research done in terms of glare. And I think that uh, the um, lighting community together with uh, designer community address this uh, glare problems quite well. In terms of the circadian metrics, you know, this is still a novelty of us. I mean, recently we carried out 16 workshops in four countries with different practitioners, and we asked them how to assess daylight. And we asked them whether any of them are using circadian metrics uh, in a real practice. And unfortunately, the, they say no. So, um, there is a relation, but there is still, you know, uh, it's more um, uh, the face of the research than a practical uh, application. But I'm looking forward to the time when I will be asked as a designer to design a building you, who, uh, or which will be not only visually pleasant or aesthetically ple pleasant, but it will be biological, it will have some biological impact on, on the users. I think that's the future, but We'll see how it goes. And that is certainly a question that we'll return to in the larger round. Uh, the last question, by the way, was from Adil Shalag Eldin. Uh, so I would, we've now reached the time where we should have a round table discussion. And there have been a number of questions that uh, people have been wanted, wanting to ask to all of you. So if all of the panelists would please turn on their cameras, uh, we can then uh, begin this roundtable discussion.
So uh, what I thought a good way to start this roundtable uh, discussion, uh, given the question that we asked midterm, uh, what can you do to get more daylight in your lives? People gave a wide range of ideas uh, focusing uh, upon ways to get outdoors, ways to get exposed to sunlight. And I would ask each of you as three very different professionals, uh, what would be your advice to people? Uh, one take home message for getting uh, light into their lives uh, in the right way. Uh, I guess I'd start with you, uh, Urs. Uh, how, what would you tell people? Okay, so, I mean, you know what I like to do. I go, I go often running over lunchtime and I think, uh, this is a, a good habit. Uh, you don't really have to run. You can also just take a, a take a walk, because then you have, especially during winter, you have a, a relatively high amount of uh, light, and um, you walk for about half an hour or an hour, and like this, you make sure that during a phase where light is good and not bad, you get uh, enough light. And I think if you turn that into a habit that you go over lunchtime for a walk, that uh, helps your clock considerably to uh, synchronize properly to uh, the daylight cycle and to the activity phase. Thank you. Thomas, how about you? What, what advice would you give to people? Um, if you look how te technology develops and, and we carry around the, the smartphones, et cetera, so, so you can do more and more things outdoors. Um, it, it's not raining every day. It, it looks, it, so now in Germany, it looks like it's, it's raining forever, but, but <laughs> there's, there's still hope on the horizon. Um, you can have your work break outdoors. You can do your, your, your lunch breaks outdoors. You can, have, you can have walks and talks around to, to discuss, to have lab meetings outdoors, work group discussions. Um, sports, of course, is, is ideally to do outdoors. Um, sitting closer to a larger window or a, lin a window at all. Um, walking a dog, playing with your kids outdoors. Um, so, I mean, there, there are plenty of reasons um, why, why we should go go outdoors to visit places, to, 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 to explore the city. Maybe, maybe you live in a place where, you, where, you, where, you, where there are still areas or streets you haven't visited yet. So you could, you could, you could stroll around the, the, the places. And, and so there are endless, endless reasons that, that take you out. Um, the motivation certainly plays a role. And as was just said, make it a habit. Make it a habit and, and, and get some some um, diversity to it. So not doing the same thing every day, but, but Monday you do this, Tuesday this, Wednesday this, et cetera. Um, I think the, the development in technology makes it, makes it possible that we are more and more mobile um, and independent of any places. Thank you. And Natalia, I've been admiring your brightly lit office. Uh, I've been using this very nice background uh, because my office is not as nicely lit here. Uh, what advice would you give us? To go out, to have a walk. Uh, we uh, have an internal joke uh, here with my students that I always ask students to take a daylight shower. So a 15 minutes of daylight shower recommended for everybody every day. Despite the uh, you know outside conditions, that's that's what we recommend, and I think it's uh, yeah leave the build environment, go outside, leave your building, uh, try to take your lunch outside, try to take uh, phone calls outside. This important. So as you can see, uh, many of you uh, had already suggested uh, these excellent recommendations, saying that you could do these in your lives, uh, and so uh, I hope. Uh, that you will. Uh, another question, which I will find again in, uh, in a moment uh, to report the author of it, was asking about circadian lighting. So I guess I'll first ask uh, the biologists, uh, Urs and Thomas, what they think would be important for smart lighting principles 
And then I would ask you, Natalia, to uh, comment on whether this is possible today, hopefully possible in the future, or impractical. So Urs, uh, what kind of circadian smart lighting do you think, based on your research, uh, ought to be, ought to be uh, brought into uh, lighting design? Yeah, <laughs> you see the... Um... I, I think, uh, especially in winter, the most important thing there is that you have a high enough intensity of light. So that means uh, you just need to get as much light into the building, for example, as possible. Uh, uh, I think there, what wavelength it is, although it changes over uh, the day, is not so important at that point because in winter you just need to have a, a high intensity. That means you, you should get in most of uh, the uh, light at noon because that, there you have the highest intensity. And, and then you uh, prevent actually uh, desynchronization of clocks because you get the strong uh, light uh, signal. The light in the morning and in the evening, uh, I mean, I, I'm talking now about natural light, is, is usually uh, less in intensity and of a spectral, more sp reduced in, in the, in, in the uh, spectral variability. So, and has a, a, you know, another effect that, um, yeah, is, is less predictable than when you have a really strong noon light, which helps to synchronize uh, the clocks. Thomas, uh, from your perspective in uh, human research, uh, what, what kind of uh, circadian smart lighting do you think people ought to be putting into buildings? Well, um, so research-wise, I think it's in its infancy. So I think it, it, it starts with acknowledging that light has this impact on our biology and that there's some diversity. Um, it's a hide-and-seek thing. So I have, I have one, one thing here, which is a pair of, of glasses. So it has LED um, diodes in it. So you can use this if, if there's not sufficient light in the room. So it goes more and more into this, into this personalization of, of your light environment. You can have desk lamps and, and et cetera. But also what you need is you need these breaks from your light. So if it's, if it's a pair of orange glasses or whatever. So it, it, it's, this, it's this hide and seek game. You need to understand what, what is light doing to your body and then to accommodate this. I think technique is, is going into that way. Uh, mimicking light, mimicking daylight in, inside of buildings. Um, it's not yet there ready from the shelf. It's sometimes it's a bit more marketing than it is, um, but it's, but it's, um, but, but we're getting there. So it, it's a good way, um, to, to, to go into this direction. Um, but what would, what we need actually is, is a, is a way better understanding of, of individuality and how, how people, how individuals react and, and res respond to these, um, respond to these light environments. So um, I think it goes into this personalization um, corner where you, where you pick your tool that helps you personally to, to get the best lighting. Um, the big question mark there is what for? So it, it, should, it should have a purpose. It, it's not there without a purpose. So if you, once you go into manipulating light environments, the question is what for? And the outcomes are diverse, so we do not have the light solution for all of the of the topics. So it it it, it, it seems to depend if it's about learning or if it's about well being or if it's about sleep that there are different solutions that we should take. So, uh, Natalia, you've heard from two biologists what they'd like to see. Uh, what do we actually have? Uh, we already have technologies which allowed us to synchronize daylight with electrical lighting, and then electrical lighting is miming, uh, mimicking daylighting, which is good. So it changes, and we need changes. We we can, uh, I mean, we cannot work under constant uh, lighting in terms of uh, you know its uh, intensity and color. 
we need uh, to change our lighting environment. And that's something to apply this on a bigger scale, that will be an issue, but also to personalize uh, light. That's also something we have to consider because majority of us, even children, they started to work in front of the computers and, you know, a lighting uh, conditions, uh, I mean, uh, uh, when you are working in front of the computers are also uh, very specific. And uh, we, uh, we usually tend to, we are so into uh, those machines that we, uh, uh, we stop thinking about uh, the environment uh, around us. The problem is when we personalize uh, uh, light, when we give the users an option to, for example, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, control the light, uh, or control electric light, they often don't do that. They are too busy. And that's something, I think this, this bigger understanding that we need this changeability and we need to, uh, uh, we need to uh, think about our health. That's something we have to uh, talk and address and educate uh, a wider audience about that. And I th uh, this talk is also a perfect platform to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, this clearly could go on for quite a bit longer. There are 22 questions in the chat. I'd encourage all of the speakers to scroll through. We're not going to get to 22 questions uh, now. In fact, we're almost out of time already. But Natalia, you mentioned education. And at this point, I'd like to mention that the people uh, that you see here today and heard from are actually the same people that have been developing a course uh, about daylight uh, that will be free uh, to everyone. Uh, and in two hours, you can uh, hear from these people and multiple others uh, in more detail uh, what motivates them in the search of daylight and its application uh, and what are the biological mechanisms behind it. Uh, to give you an idea of that, I'm going to play a one minute series of snippets from this course uh, so you can see for yourself what it might be like uh, should you decide to try it later. Like this, you can then see when the clock gene is activated that light is produced here in yellow color and when it is repressed, the color fades away. And one production of color, so emerging of color and fading off of color is one circadian cycle. So what do you think of when you think of daylight? Probably each one of us thinks of something different. And that's because there are a lot of characteristics of daylight, a lot of characteristics which are different to electric light. And I try to put them all on one slide and we're gonna look at these in a couple of minutes. If we go deeper, we will see uh, what is the daylight appraisal and the urban design. So how you can design the city in order to make people happy with the outdoor environment, be visual and thermal comfort. So being satisfied uh, with the environment if it's not too hot or too cold. So as you can see, uh, there is a world of daylight that is awaiting you. Uh, this is a project under development. Uh, we have been trying to put this film together in spite of a world pandemic that makes it very difficult to bring actors uh, to Zurich uh, where it is being filmed. So uh, we've nevertheless uh, had a very good success and we hope to finish soon. But as a checkout, I would uh, close this session by asking you once again to go to menti.com and help us to uh, make this project interesting to you. And so in this respect, uh, one question that I'd be very interested in knowing is what would you like to learn in this course that will help you in your work uh, in a few words? So what can we include uh, that you would uh, like to hear more about? Uh, I hope it is already there. And if it isn't, we still have the opportunity to put it there. So we'll give you a, a moment to put some answers into that.
there we see uh, mobile artificial lights, uh, daylight design in buildings. Uh, so a number of uh, very nice questions, circadian metrics, daylight application and case studies. Uh, so far, we're doing reasonably well. And I think that uh, all of the questions you mentioned here, uh, sustainable lighting solutions to make the most of natural light. Uh, I think that uh, many of you will find this course uh, an interesting thing. And again, uh, this costs nothing. There is no advertising associated with it. This is not some way to uh, get you to pay something for anything. Uh, this is thanks to uh, the Daylight Academy and the Velux Foundation uh, that is trying to uh, better uh, health uh, in the world. So a second question is, uh, we've had a very nice session today and I very much appreciate all of your feedback, but what topics would you like to see in future Daylight Academy events uh, in a few words? Uh, the people who are organizing these sessions are here listening right now. And so in this way, uh, by typing in a word or two, uh, you can influence uh, our future online program. So there we see case studies, workflow of planning daylight, shading methods, simulation tools, sustainable, sustainable dynamic lighting, water, uh, many fascinating questions. And I assure you that we will be uh, thinking about these answers, attempting to pool experts uh, such as the ones we brought today uh, to these topics. And I hope we'll be able to offer you uh, some interesting content about these. And finally, uh, a relatively fun exercise in one word. Uh, how are you leaving this session? Because yes, I appreciate uh, that uh, over a hundred of you have stayed through for this uh, hour and a half together. Uh, and uh, here is your chance to give us uh, a word of feedback. Inspired, thank you very much. Uh, all of this, speakers here today have worked hard to put this uh, together and uh, we at least are inspired, motivated and happy uh, by all of the uh, feedback uh, that you are giving us. And to the person who said confused, I'm very sorry, uh, we were trying and uh, we will clearly try harder. So, uh, I think it is time to turn this back uh, over to uh, Lydia to close the session. And uh, it's been a great pleasure uh, uh, and a privilege uh, to have spent this hour and a half with you. Thank you, Steve. And thank you again to all participants for joining us and participating so actively in the discussion. It was a very insightful session and, of course, a big thank you to the speakers and to the moderator. So before closing the webinar, I would like to bring your attention to the next two sessions of the Daylight Awareness Week. So you can see here tomorrow we have the second session and there we will build on what we have learned today and together with three health specialists we will look more precisely at some health issues that can be related to a lack of daylight. So that's for the second session. And the third and last session takes place on Thursday. This time it will be in the form of a round table. It will be very interdisciplinary with experts in plant biology and ecology, but also anthropology and urban design. And we will discuss the role of daylight in seasonal rhythms and how this affects plants, animals, and humans, taking into consideration different latitudes and also our indoor lifestyle that is increasingly estranging us from these natural rhythms. So a very interesting topic too, so don't hesitate to sign up. It is still open and uh, you can find all information on the Daylight Academy website. So of course, we will be very happy to welcome you again. And so with that, thank you very much again and hopefully see you tomorrow. <laughs>